What's up, guys? All right. Yeah, I think that's. This ain't English. This ain't math. It's Mr. Drover's science class. Apply yourself to any test, then you are surely gonna pass. Open your mind and catch a vibe. Put a little science inside your life. You can do it, and so can I. Come on, everybody, let's learn tonight. It's science time. It's science time. 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 Hello, and welcome back to another episode. I'm Mr. Drover. Now, today we're going to continue our investigation on energy, but specifically, we're going to be talking about the conversion of energy and how we convert it. But before we begin, I want to take a look at this thing I ordered online. Now, in this box is something called a perpetual motion machine. Now, supposedly, this machine creates more energy than it intakes. Now, if this is true, we are actually breaking the laws of physics. Unreal. Wait, what? Why is there sirens outside? Wait, no, this is a big understanding, misunderstanding, guys. I was actually just explaining Ladies what- Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Now, you're probably wondering why everyone is making such a big deal about this. All I did was buy something that could potentially break the laws of physics. Wait, now that I think about it, that would be a pretty big deal. But I think they're going about this all wrong. The truth is, if I did actually break the laws of physics, it would be an extremely big deal. But not in the criminal sense. It is actually the job of scientists to try to falsify each other's claims that includes laws of physics. If someone found out how to break the laws of physics, they would no longer be laws. Unfortunately, that's not how this weird court system is working right now, and they think I actually did a crime by potentially breaking the laws of physics. In fact, the reason why some findings are generally regarded as true or facts is because scientists have tried and tried again over and over to falsify those claims with no luck. So, we consider them true until new data comes around and gives us an idea of why it was false, and then we rethink our whole idea about the premise. Oh, okay. Okay, I think it's my turn in court, guys. The best way I think I can win this case is if I explain energy conversion and the law of conservation to the judge, so I can tell him that no matter what machine I had, there is no way I was going to break the laws of physics. All rise for the Honorable Judge Randy DeRube. Thank you, everyone. You all may be seated. First, I want to introduce our prosecution, Eric Bramley. Thank you for joining us. And our defendant, Mr. Drover. What is this, a Star Trek pilot or something? Now, let's see here. Hmm. Ah, yes, Mr. Drover. It seems like you are accused of attempting or actually breaking the laws of physics. Mr. Drover, I'll give you a chance to defend yourself. What do you have to say in the matter? Thank you, Your Honor. To begin to explain my innocence clearly, I need to first explain that it would be almost impossible to break the laws of physics in the first place. So last week in my video, we talked about calculating work, kinetic energy, and potential energy. We also touched upon the laws of thermodynamics, the exact laws that I'm accused of breaking. Now, you've probably heard of things or products that produce energy. These usually go by the name or descriptor called a generator. Some people that don't know the laws of thermodynamics or have a misinformed interpretation of them might think that generators like this produce its energy from scratch. Objection, Your Honor. What is his point? Mr. Drover, please don't run. In fact, nothing can make energy. It can only be transformed. For example, Your Honor, let's say you lost power to your house. But I live in an apartment. And in order to power your house temporarily, you pull out your gas power generator. But I don't own a generator. When you're using the generator, you're not actually making any energy. You're just converting the chemical energy from the gasoline that you put in the generator to electrical energy to power up your house. It really is just an energy converter. 
What are you talking about? Now, fun fact, you actually don't need a machine to witness energy conversion. Huh? Uh... In fact, energy conversion is happening everywhere around you all the time. Let's take a look at the gravitational potential energy of this dodgeball. Now, this is gravitational huh? potential energy right now. But as soon as I release it, that energy gets converted into kinetic energy. But your honor... As the ball dropped, the potential energy decreased, while the kinetic energy increased, and they do so proportionally to one another. Your Honor, Mr. Dover hasn't given any evidence to his case yet. He's off topic. A pendulum shows this conversion of potential energy to kinetic I am well aware of how a pendulum works, Mr. Drover. Even though this might sound like an endless loop, which could essentially convert energy from potential energy to kinetic energy back and forth till the end of time, this is actually not the case. Huh? Like any machine, a pendulum is not 100% efficient. So it loses some energy during the transfer. Your Honor. Efficiency is a measurement of the amount of useful work output from an energy conversion process. In the pendulum's case, the work inputted is the work produced by its mass, the acceleration of gravity, and the distance it dropped from. Your Honor. However, because this pendulum isn't isolated away from every other physical thing in the universe, some of that kinetic energy produced is lost fighting against friction of the bearing, combating the opposite forces of air resistance and many other potential forces. In short, every time that pendulum goes through a cycle of converting the potential energy to the kinetic energy, some energy is lost. This results in a pendulum starting with lower potential energy every time it reaches its apex and restarts its loop. This happens until the ball no longer moves. Okay, Your Honor, that's enough. He goes through this whole rant about how energy cannot be created or destroyed. And then he immediately after he talks about a pendulum and how it loses energy. Isn't that contradictory? Uh... Your Honor, if the prosecutor listened to what I said correctly, he would realize that none of the energy was destroyed. Some of that energy was simply transferred to other pieces of matter, such as air, or the energy got converted to heat due to the friction of the bearings. All the energy can be accounted for. It would just take a ton of math. But it could be done. What's that word you used again? Efficiency? Efficiency, or the percent at which something can be efficient, can be calculated by dividing useful output over the total input and multiplying that sum by 100. But your honor... For example, a light bulb requires an energy input of 125 joules, and it gives off 25.8 joules of light energy. The remaining energy is converted into heat. What is the efficiency of the light bulb? Well, to figure this out, we'd grab the useful energy, the energy that is actually producing light, which is 25.8 joules, and divide it by the total energy we're putting into it which in this case is 125 joules. Once we do that, we multiply that sum by 100 to get the percentage of efficiency. Your Honor, this whole idea of energy conversion isn't really backed up by anything he said. He could be making it all up for all we know. Actually, Your Honor, there's tons of evidence to support my claim. Aside from the extremely strong mathematical evidence, we also have evidence we can directly observe. The first piece of observable evidence is motion. In order for something to move, it requires energy to be transferred to it. Just watch my last video. The second evidence is the position of the object, or the change in position particularly. In this case, the position was changed so the dodgeball was raised above the surface of the Earth meaning there's gravitational potential energy. Just again, watch my last video. Another piece of evidence that energy is being converted is when the object changes shape due to forces. A lot of times you can see forces bending or stretching an object. The pendulum really isn't a good example for this, but imagine an archer's bow. Huh? The bow itself will bend back due to the force of you pulling on the string. The last piece of evidence I want to talk about is the change in temperature. Again, not really that obvious with the pendulum, but the change in temperature can be seen in other examples more easily. Like your car, it converts a ton of energy into heat. This is why the car engine gets so hot. If your car was 100% efficient in converting your gas to kinetic energy or electrical energy, your car engine would be only as warm as the environment around it. 
So you're saying everything we do involves some sort of energy transfer? Am I hearing you right? Yes! And that every time I fill up my car at the gas station, I'm actually wasting almost all of that energy? Yes, that is true. But I wouldn't be too upset about it if I were you. No energy system is 100% efficient. Wait, an energy system? See, over the last century, humans have created these amazing machines that convert the energy in our environment to usable energy. Now, all the energy in our environment can be traced back to two primary sources. Primary sources? Yes, the first primary source is the sun. The sun is the origin of all energy involving wind, hydro, meaning water, fossil fuels, and the energy we extract from plants and animals, normally called biomass. Okay, so now we're talking about plants now. All of these sources I just mentioned have received their energy from the sun and converted that energy in one way or another. Oh, come on, what does this have to do with technology systems of energy conversion? Judge, your honor, I'm almost there. The second primary source is the accumulation of all other non-solar sources, meaning they have no link to the sun. These include nuclear energy, referring to the breakdown of uranium atoms, geothermal energy, the heat coming from the center of the earth, and tidal energy, the energy produced when the gravity of the moon moves the water in our oceans to create tides. Enough! I can't stand this anymore. Get to your point, make whatever argument you have, or else I will grab the potential energy from this fist and transfer it right to your jawbone. Okay, okay. My point is, is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. The laws of physics, in this case the laws of thermodynamics, are not laws we are supposed to follow, it's laws that we have no choice but to follow. The reason I brought up technological systems is to show you that humans have invested centuries into finding new ways to harness existing energy from our environment into usable energy. We've created giant dams that manipulate water to spin giant turbines to convert kinetic energy into electrical energy. We've also used coal and decaying uranium to heat water into steam so it can spin turbines as well, also converting kinetic energy to electrical energy. Heck, we've even created chemical solar panels to directly convert solar energy into usable electrical energy. Now why would humans spend all this money, time, blood, sweat and tears to create all these technologies if we could just create energy out of nothing? It wouldn't make sense. And if a machine was able to output more energy than inputted, then why has it not been utilized yet? Why hasn't anyone taken advantage of it? So there, the math, the observations, the background information, the motives, the general economics of it all are in favor of me being not guilty. And even if I did try to break the laws of physics, it's not a bad thing to try to falsify something. That's what scientists do. They try and reproduce the same things over and over again in hopes that maybe something else will happen unexpected. Then we can reevaluate our own laws and theories on things. Thank you, Mr. Drover. Mr. Bramley, is there anything you want to say for your closing argument? Uh, well, um, uh, just let's see here. Uh, no, Your Honor, I have nothing to add. Okay, Mr. Drover, this is looking very good for you. Do you have any closing remarks before I make my verdict? Yes, Your Honor, one more thing. Here's a transcript of what I'm about to tell you, for the record. Thank you. Ready? Despite the amazing innovations we've had in the last couple centuries in the energy sector, it is important to keep looking forward and finding new ways to create energy that limit dangerous waste products such as CO2 and other unhealthy pollutants. We must work together to develop processes that are sustainable and don't jeopardize the survival of- Wait, hold up a second. You spelled both jeopardize and pollutants wrong in your transcript? Huh? Well, I'm sorry about that, but that doesn't really- That's an invalid argument. So I sentence you to one week in jail. What?